Okay, well, good evening. Uh, my name is Pierre Atlas. I, I am a political science professor and I serve as director of the Richard Luger Franciscan Center for Global Studies. Um, we are the, um, the, the host for this evening. And um, before I introduce uh, our, our speakers and, and, and everybody else, I just want to say a little bit about the Global Studies program. Um, most of you look like your students, um, so you probably already know about it, but we have a minor that fits with any major of Marion in the uh, liberal arts and sciences or the professional studies. How many people here are global studies minors? Okay, so I don't, good. Um, and uh, we also have our speaker series, uh, which is free and open to the public, and we uh, have our brochure outside, um, and uh, so be sure to grab one when, when you leave. And uh, after tonight, our next event is on November 8th, just in two weeks from now, with uh, the Indianapolis Symphony Orchestra, um, or representatives of the Symphony Orchestra and the International Violin Competition of Indianapolis. And it's on uh, Indianapolis launching the careers of gold medal musicians. And we will actually have um, Augustin Heidelick, who is a, a previous winner of the International Violin Competition, who will be here uh, as part of a panel. Um, and he'll even do a quick performance. Uh, it'll be here, and this will be the venue. Um, and, and then uh, December 9th, uh, Sunday, uh, former U.S. Senator Richard Luger will give his annual Global Studies Address. And then in February, we will have, I think it's our 13th annual event with Catholic Relief Services. And this is on uh, rebuilding refugees' lives in Sri Lanka with um, the CRS uh, program director from Sri Lanka will be here. And then in March, uh, we will host the uh, uh, Consul General of Mexico to talk about U.S.-Mexican relations. And then it's not on the brochure, but we haven't set the date yet. But in April, we will also have um, a senior uh, uh, person from the Marshall Space Center talking, which is NASA, um, talking about um, the U.S. space uh, program and, and the mission to Mars. Um, and so that'll be in April. And so this is for the, this is the academic, this is the 16th year of the Global Studies Speaker Series. All events are free and open to the public. They will be filmed on YouTube. So if, if you can't be here, or people that you know uh, aren't here but would like to see these things, um, then by all means, uh, please uh, tell them about it. So uh, tonight's event is uh, co-sponsored by the Center for Interfaith Cooperation and also by the uh, International Center. And um, the, the reason um, interfaith, and I'm on the board of the International uh, of the Center for Interfaith Cooperation. Um, the, the topic uh, it, it, it deals with a lot of different things, including global philanthropy, including um, uh, helping people in the developing world, and that's one reason why CIC is interested in co-sponsoring it. Um, and also, uh, as, as you will hear in a moment, um, the International Center is very much involved in a lot of uh, citizen diplomacy type things, and it's going to be a really interesting uh, discussion. I'm really looking forward to hearing it. Um, to introduce everybody and get the ball rolling, um, I would like to bring up Martin Baird, who is the president and CEO of the International Center of Indiana. Thank you, Dr. Atlas and uh, Marion University for allowing us to, to partner on the program tonight. Uh, just a few words on the International Center. We are a nonprofit organization that was founded in 1973 and actually by former Senator Luger, when he was mayor of Indianapolis and needed at that time a team of translators, translators and interpreters. Uh, right now, uh, currently we're working on all, in all kinds of international affairs, uh, from helping international employees and their families with the setting in process when they come to work and live here in Indiana, uh, to providing intercultural and cross-cultural training to companies and organizations that do international business or have a diverse workforce. And one of the uh, uh, key and signature programs that we are involved in is the International Visitors Leadership Program by the U.S. Department of State out of Washington, D.C., regardless who governs in the White House. That is a program that is in place for more than 70 years. And uh, the uh, U.S. government, through the embassies around the world, invites emerging leaders from all over the world to come to the U.S. for three to four weeks, starting D.C. and then visiting three to four different cities to learn on a certain topic. And we are a partner in helping build the itinerary and the cultural program for these delegations. And, uh, and the only organization in the state of Indiana that is involved in, in that program. And tonight we, we, we talk about all, all about citizen diplomacy and in a way that you might not expect. All of our panelists are fostering people-to-people -people relations here in Indianapolis, but through their respective professional and personal lives. Citizen diplomacy is one of our nation's best tools to build positive relations between countries as well as lead to economic development and international relief. It takes a village, you might say. International engagement happens through business like Ceramic Wheels, through academics and athletics, such as Marin University, 
and through nonprofits like the International Center. All of these institutions, alongside the US government, are a part of an ecosystem of positive interaction between the United States and the world. If you are a student of international affairs, and we know we have a few here tonight, and I'm sure what career path you might take, listen up. You might go to work for the US government or an NGO, but you might also take the path of business or sports or academia. These careers also play an important role in our country's contributions to the world. In particular, we want to set the stage by talking about SRAM's humanitarian efforts through World Bicycle Relief. And as an intro uh, about World Bicycle Relief, uh, please enjoy a brief video for an introduction of that wonderful organization. When I'm stressed out, I just take my bicycle, go for a ride. It's amazing. I just feel that I'm not even in this world. I don't know how to explain, but it's just the best feeling that anyone can experience in his or her life. Education is a tool that can be used to change the life of somebody, the life of society, the life of a country. The people who go to school uh, get a chance to see the world as one. Well. It opens your mind. Education, education can make you to be someone you never even expected to be. At first I came to this school, I was just alone. When I met Kelly and many of my friends, they taught me, don't be shy, we are all the same. It was so surprising to see the Muslim girls riding the bike. It changed my opinion because I now knew Muslim girls, they're just like us. We need one another in terms of sharing ideas, sharing resources. All people of different tribes, of different colors, of different beliefs are supposed to, to live together in harmony. I have a lot of friends who have dropped out of school. I had a lot of challenges. I didn't come to school because most of the time I got late. When she was given the bicycle, slowly by slowly, Ayan started showing up. I never knew Ayan in this school. When we were given the bicycles, you could find yourself riding, then you meet Ayan and say hi. You, you become friends, riding together. The other girls were like, you mean she can play? Running a bicycle has changed my life a lot. I've come to face the world. It has helped me be confident. We can be ourselves, not what people want us to be. It's the magic of the bicycle. It is bringing life, encouraging students to explore their potential. In this school, we are a family. And everything that we do, we do together. When we fall, we fall together, not leaving anyone behind. Together we rise. Together we rise. Together we rise. Together we rise. Cycling with each and every one that connects me to all three countries. 
I'd like to start with Dean Peterson, and while I call you, maybe uh, take, take your seat. Um, Dean Peterson is the head coach and team director of Marin University cycling team, the best team in the nation. And that's not a surprise because he is the best coach in the nation. <laughs> Also, the director of Indy Cycleplex, the home of Mayon's Taylor's uh, Before he joined Marion, Dean was an educator and team leader at the Orchard School. He holds a bachelor's degree in organizational leadership from Purdue University and a master's in educational leadership from Butler University. An interesting uh, uh, side note he served in the Peace Corps in Togo, and, and one of his key projects was providing bicycles to women for transportation and going goods. And what connects me to him is the first time we met was at uh, the mayor's bike ride, and the former mayor Ballard, which started here at the Velodrome, and then we rode into Indianapolis and came back to the Velodrome. And you, the mayor, and I rode abreast and, 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 and were part of that. So, and from memories to that. Our next panelist is Chris Case. Chris is the uh, operations director for SOREM, Zip Wheels a carbon wheel and high-end bicycle components factory here in Indianapolis. Previously, he held management position in both operations and engineering for Honeywell, Yale in Security, and Stanley Black and Decker. He has a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering from Auburn University and a Master of Business Administration from University of Tennessee. He's an advocate for safe, great places to ride, working with support for SRAM to identify opportunities to make Indy region one of the best for bikes. And what connects me to you is two years ago, we uh, both uh, participated in the Indianapolis Chamber of Commerce Leadership Exchange, which took place in Minneapolis. And we both explored the city on a bike. You know, we were riding together. It's the best way to, to uh, uh, get around in a new environment. And last, but definitely not least, my colleague, Ashley Eason. Ashley is the Vice President for Programs and Services at the International Center since February of 2017. Before, she was with U.S. Global Leadership Coalition in Washington, D.C. in the role as Regional Outreach Manager and then promoted to Director. Ashley has a Bachelor's in Communication Studies and Russian Language from Texas Tech University and spent a short-term international internship in Moscow, Russia and also a Master's in International Peace and Conflict Resolution from the American University in DC. Um, together, what connects me to her is we both pro promote biking to work. You know, quite often uh, we meet halfways, I live in Carmel, she lived in Broad, Broad River, we meet halfways and then take the one on uh, to downtown Indy. And uh, one time she asked me, is uh, my, me as a scientist, is that a requirement for me to get in the job with the international <laughs> <laughs> And I said, no, it's not one of, it's the requirement <laughs> to work for me. So Ashley will not only be a panelist, but also your moderator tonight. Ashley, without further ado, you have it. He's right, it was an unknown requirement. I was very glad that I passed the test. Um, and my favorite memory of cycling with Martin was uh, last year's Bike to Work Day 2017. Uh, we met Mayor Hoxett in Broad Ripple uh, for Bike to Work Day and rode all the way downtown in a thunderstorm. Mm -hmm. But it's okay because we had uh, the mayor's security detail blocking every street for us so we didn't have to stop at every uh, crossing on the Monad. Uh, and it was delightful and I was very happy to have the chance to take a shower when I got to the office. So um, it's been a lot of fun to be a cyclist here. And uh, it was, you know, for us, for my husband and I, one of maybe not a requirement, but it, it, if we had been pressured on it, it probably would have been a requirement for us to move to Indiana. So uh, we appreciate Mayor Ballard, Mayor Hogsett, and all the others that are working to promote cycling here in Indiana. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Atlas, for inviting us to partner uh, tonight uh, and to have such a unique way to talk about citizen diplomacy and uh, with something that many of us are very passionate about. And as we saw in the video, uh, you know, cycling here, bicycles don't always get 
I think the respect that they deserve uh, is a really powerful tool uh, for education, for business, uh, for transportation. Uh, and so I'm excited tonight to talk a little bit about that, but also how it ties us all together and um, I think makes a huge difference uh, in places that it's needed quite a bit. Uh, so tonight I'll start with um, talking a little bit about why the International Center is connected to SRAM Zip Wheels. Um, you know, Chris, maybe if you could talk a little bit about uh, SRAM and Zip Wheels here in Indianapolis, it might tell a little bit about how we got to connect and how we work together as an organization. Yeah, sure. So uh, SRAM was founded in oh. Chicago. Can you use your microphone? Oh, yep. Sure enough. All right. So SRAM was uh, founded in Chicago in 1987, and Zip Wheels was actually founded in Indianapolis in 1988, so just a year apart. Uh, in 2008, uh, Zip was acquired by SRAM. Uh, here in Indianapolis, we were making carbon fiber wheels, and then with the acquisition with, uh, with SRAM, we're also now distributing uh, a lot of the service parts and warranty parts uh, throughout the Americas, right out of the Indianapolis location. In 2010, SRAM built a purpose-built uh, facility for manufacturing wheels, uh, but also for the distribution of those, those parts that, uh, that go out through all, all the Americas. Is that better? All right, perfect. And we have, in Indy, we have about 300 people. Uh, SRAM has around 3,000 globally. Uh, and uh, we have a very diverse workforce here in Indy. We, uh, we partner with uh, the refugee program. Okay, all right, I'll just hold it down here further away, so. Uh, again, we have a very diverse workforce being, you know, around the world in multiple locations. Uh, a lot of our employees in other countries, but here in Indy, we, we partnered with, uh, with some of the Exodus refugees that are located in the south side of town. So that's a good uh, population of our, our direct labor workforce, uh, which makes us, I think, very unique and makes us stronger. So having a diverse workforce, not just uh, different cultures and, uh, and ethnicities, but immigrants recently relocated mm -hmm. here, refugees recently relocated here, what is that like uh, on a manufacturing floor? <laughs> well, it can be challenging. Communication is certainly an area that we're, we're working to improve, and um, you know, it, it goes beyond even communication. I, I can think back to one of the very first um, picnics that we had at the location. It reminded me a lot of a junior high school dance, mm -hmm. where all the girls are on one side, all the boys are on the other side of the, 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 uh, the gymnasium. In this case, it was people from the different cultures on different areas of the, the picnic and there wasn't a lot of interaction and uh, we, you know, through partnering with the International Center, learning more about each other's cultures, learning how to better communicate, learning how some of the things that we do that, that we just take for granted, how that can be offensive to uh, people from, from other cultures and learning how we need to adjust and, uh, and to understand their culture better. And I can say, since our, our last picnic, uh, there's a lot more interaction, there's a lot more things that we're doing to engage all of our cultures and bring us together. Not to become more like each other, or more like not asking them to be more like our culture, but really trying to find that, that, uh, that, that unique culture where we bring everyone's backgrounds together and create that for the Indianapolis location. Thank you. Uh, it has been our pleasure to work with you and your team and, and, and really find ways to help you learn from each other and, and better understand, you know, as you said, it's those little things that you don't even expect. Oh, eye contact, it means something totally different. Uh, here in the U.S., we're taught, you know, direct eye contact with someone, a firm handshake, that demonstrates respect and engagement and it demonstrates that you are interested in that person and in some other cultures maybe some that are in, uh, in your workforce that it's the opposite it would actually be disrespectful and so when you come to the table together you don't know that those differences exist it can be really hard so that's wonderful that you've invested in that for your workforce 
uh, here in Indianapolis. Uh, Coach Peterson, just try to put this one in the middle. Um, you run the country, the world's best cycling team, and uh, I can imagine that running a team, like running a company, there's a lot of challenges working with diverse opinions and backgrounds and experiences. Um, what are some of those principles that are important to you as a coach uh, that may be important for the cycling, but also might just be important for life and working together with different people? Uh, that's a big question. <laughs> uh, so uh, the first word that comes to my mind is inclusivity, and we talk about it a lot, and what it means and what it looks like in action. Um, and, you know, we have eight different countries. We have 17% uh, of our 67 riders right now are from other countries. Um, 20 states are represented. And with all of that diversity, there's also different learning styles, different, different things that come to the table that um, are super important to try to uh, teach each other how to listen and interact and be selfless and empathetic. So, and it's in a uh, competitive environment. We, we, we are a competitive team. Uh, it's a school first program. All of these things are built into our mission and what we do, but the, the biggest thing is how do we treat one another to be a team? And the team's first and the second. And that's, that's, our, that's our big, that's our push. And, and it, is, it is somewhat complex. At 60 to 70 riders is about what we carry at this point. And our international, um, the number of international student cyclists has gone up over the last three to four years based on a stronger commitment from your university to actually bring more international students here. And I think we're learning as we go, as a, as a school and as a team. That's wonderful. Well, how do you feel that the team is connected to university life here at Marion? What are some of the unique ways that you're involved or, or that you connect with the larger population here? So, in 1992, one of the things that we, or that I heard when I came, well, 1992 was when we started, in 2006 when I came, um, we were six or seven riders left. The school had gone through some, some challenges in the uh, early 2000s. I came in 2006 and we had six to seven riders that were going to stick around after a coaching change and a lot of changes here. But the thing that I heard the most was that the cyclists weren't connected as a, as a group of people to the, to the overall culture of the school. So that, that was our, our first focus and how do, we, how do we do that? And we really looked into how do we get involved and uh, how do we people to do more as um, young people to do more with other students um, and, and keep them from being separated. And we, we have trouble with that sometimes because cycling is very different. It's certainly not a traditional sport, uh, not in our country, I don't think. So uh, it can be very different and, and it, uh, even, you know, watching it is different. We can all talk about football here probably and know what we're talking about a little bit. But when you talk about cycling and why somebody got caught who was three minutes ahead and then somebody else goes and there's these different kinds of attacks and things that go on, people are kind of like, what is going on here? Why aren't they just staying together? Or why isn't somebody just taking off? So, so all of these things make, I think, some challenges for, the, um, for a cycling team and a, a group of students that are coming from that background uh, to integrate better into the macro culture going on. Well, to go to the macro culture of the university, uh, what are some of Marianne's core values that, that you're addressing and bringing to the table with the cycling team that inform what you do? So we, we talk a lot about uh, inclusion, team, I wrote some of these down, so forgive me here, but uh, lifelong leaders, lifelong learners, um, continuing to embrace learning, uh, commitment to academic scholarship and accomplishment, um, the uh, and then personal excellence, which is a big one. Personal excellence on and off the bike, 
um, not thinking about just what we do on the bike, but but thinking about it in a balanced way with academic, social, and um, athletic achievement. All right. uh, Chris. What about SRAMs and wheels? What are some of the, your organization's core values and, and how are you seeing that expressed in your workforce, in the way that you run your manufacturing floor, in the way that you think about your overseas customers? Sure, it, you know, we, we have several. Um, I think the ones that probably relate the most to, to this forum is, um, is you know, believing in a global uh, and local collaboration, and that's a key part of our success. Caring intensely about our global team, respecting diverse cultures, leveraging local knowledge, and treating people with honesty, uh, respect, and trust at all times, no matter where they are in, in the world. So, when you think about those values, it doesn't surprise me that World Bicycle Relief is an arm of SRAM. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about that organization? What kind of work are they doing abroad? Uh, how are uh, you know, Americans and bicyclists involved? Uh, and, and what do you think the impact of their work is in the developing world? Sure, so uh, FK Day was one of the founders of SRAM, he and his brother Stan Day. And FK um, had learned about the, the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami and the devastation that happened there, and, and really wanted to, he and his wife, Leah and Ms. Bakde, wanted to understand how they could get involved and how they could help. So they reached out to learn what they could, they could uh, do. And the feedback that they received from a lot of the organizations that were on the ground there was, hey, just send us money. And, you know, part, part of uh, SRAM's purpose is believing in the power of bicycles and so he really wanted to just understand that and, and what could the power of bicycles potentially do to help that uh, specifically Sri Lanka uh, recover from that, that horrible storm. Uh, so uh, he and his wife Leah traveled to Sri Lanka, got on the ground, started talking to the different aid workers that were, that were there trying to help the recovery effort and learned that, uh, that transportation was a huge part of the equation to helping that, that uh, area recover. Uh, I think 10 miles for walking uh, would take about four hours. And with a bicycle, it's, it's about uh, four times faster, around one hour to travel that same distance. And uh, so, so they worked, identified some bicycles that could be sent to help uh, the relief effort sent those bikes, and that was really a, a key part of the recovery of that region. And they received a lot of positive feedback uh, from that effort. But one of the aid workers, when they were wrapping up, said, and, you know, it's it really interesting, and, and if you want to learn more, FK Day spoke recently at, uh, at a TEDx conference, and you can see that on, on YouTube. And so I'd encourage you all to go out and, and, uh, and watch that. Uh, but one of the aid workers approached and said, you know, 230,000 people died in this tsunami, and the same amount of people in Africa are dying every two weeks from hunger and from preventable disease. And I think you know the, the power of the bike could also have an impact on that continent. And, uh, and so that's where they had the idea to go out and uh, make a difference and to show the power of bicycles in a, in a whole different way than what SRAM had historically done. So when you talk about you know, these very heavy duty bicycles, I've had the pleasure of visiting SRAM's headquarters in my previous role in a different job, and those bicycles are heavy. I mean, I, I get tired of carrying my you know, five pound, 10 pound bike around on my shoulder for too long, but those are heavy duty 50 pound bikes or so. Um, but, they're intended not uh, for speed. They're intended to carry things, to market, to, um, to get children to school. Uh, tell me more about, if you know, the construction of the bike and what it's meant for and, and, and how uh, FK uh, and the team had to be creative about, you know, their expertise might be in racing bikes, 
what made that leap to these heavy duty bikes? Oh, that's, that's a great question. So when they heard that there was an opportunity in Africa, they actually went sourced bikes from various local suppliers on the continent. And uh, I think the, the very first opportunity was, I want to say it was 23,000 bikes for, for uh, healthcare workers there trying to stop the, per the, the spread of HIV and AIDS. And they found out very early on these bikes were failing. Just, you know, the wheels collapsing, pedals breaking. They, they just weren't designed for, you know, the, the uh, underdeveloped uh, uh, infrastructure you know, that, that a lot of people had to travel. Um, so they got involved, brought the expertise of all the engineering and SRAM, developing high performance bicycles, and started working with the local suppliers to design a bike that would hold up under the rigors of those, uh, those daily meetings. Yeah. Very cool. Um, it's, uh, it's so neat to see a company um, very, very much focused on business success, competing globally in markets around the world. It, as, as you alluded to, cycling isn't necessarily the most popular sport uh, here in the US, uh, but abroad, uh, particularly in Europe, it's extremely popular. Involved in at all stages of life and for all different reasons. Um, but I love seeing that SRAM as a company sees this not, you know, it's not about a part of their bottom line, it's because they saw a need and they had the expertise, and uh, because of the work they do, they could, could tie in right there. So, something that Martin mentioned uh, when he was introducing you is that you've spent time with the Peace Corps. Mm -hmm. Tell us more about that because then you were that aid worker on the ground trying to find solutions uh, to some of the world's biggest problems. That, that was a, yeah, a long time ago in uh, 19, it was 1988 to 1991 for me in Togo, West Africa. And I was there as a, 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 an a, a appropriate technology agent. And, uh, and mainly the, the the goal of my job was to actually build mud stoves to his, the, the, where Togo is situated. It's a very narrow country that goes straight up off the coast. Uh, it's very, it's like about 60 or 70 miles wide and it kind of goes up and meanders up through a couple of different biomes. So uh, mud stoves were a, a, a solution that we could share with local people in villages all over the country um, to burn less wood because at the at the northernmost portion of Togo, the Sahara was already beginning to kind of take over due to lack of wood and, and it just being harvested for um, firewood that is used for cooking still today. So um, these mud stoves would just be enclosing their the, pots that they had with a chimney system that you cut out with a machete and it would just burn less wood. Well this, this morphed into me realizing that the most wood was burned mainly by women who made the local beer, which is chukutu or chakpalo, depending on where you are. Um, and it's a millet-based beer that uh, was made and, and consumed as a non-alcoholic kind of porridge in the morning and then it fermented over the course of a couple days and it could be quite strong as you, uh, <laughs> if you got the right batch. Um, so these women, however, were, uh, and it was almost all women that were the business people of the villages. They were actually had quite a, um, quite a thing going with um, mud stoves that were from, from the end of this table to the end of Chris's table. And they'd have six to eight clay pots that would be enclosed by these mud stoves and they used to be over over uh, just three rocks, you know, so that the pots would be sitting on three rocks and open fire. So they started enclosing it, burning less wood, and they were carrying wood on their heads. So one of the challenges that at that time, and I looked this up a, a, a few days ago, I mean, the lifespan of women is much shorter than men. Mainly, I would say, because of where, uh, where I was at the time, and I think it's still similar, uh, the women were doing work that was truly taking more off of their lives. They were carrying 60 pounds of firewood 
that would sometimes take four days to gather um, and bring back to support this whole business that was going on. Um, fast forward to uh, a new appropriate technology was beginning to bring bikes in just as you know, bicycle relief was. Um, and there were challenges there and also then adding um, the, the local blacksmiths could, could create bike carts um, that, were pulled, that were put on the back of them. And this was beginning to actually help women uh, do what they do. And then they were also carrying 55 gallon drums and things in these, in these particular. And there were no inner tubes, they were grass tires. So that the, the rubber was over, the tire was over the rim, but it was filled with grass that was woven into two of the thin. That's how they got away from inner tubes because they couldn't get inner tubes. Um, at that time, there was a lot of work going on all over uh, Togo, West Africa, and in other places uh, in the world where good things were with good intention were being done, like water pumps and, and these bicycles we were doing. But there was no means to fix them. So they had no parts. So they started to rely on these pumps or on the bicycles, and things failed. They didn't have the means to always get, keep it going. So then they would have to change out. So these are the things that I saw. And, uh, and I think that, you know, I think some of them have, been, have gotten better over time. But the bicycle was probably the most um, amazing uh, addition to their lives that I saw that was, that was truly balancing some things out that needed to be balanced um, for all kinds of reasons. Right? But it was, it was a beautiful thing. And so we started really working with bikes uh, towards the end of my time there. And we moved all volunteers from motorcycles, which were extremely loud. And we wore these yellow helmets. And everybody knew that you know, they were, the Peace Corps people were coming. And, uh, and we moved everybody to bicycles. So we started moving around village to village um, throughout West Africa on bikes. Were you a cyclist before your Peace Corps tour? I was. Okay. Yes, I was. And so, probably never changed your grass, too. No, no, I didn't, <laughs> and I hadn't woven one together either. <laughs> but I, yeah, I did in Kenya. It was another story. There you go. That's so interesting. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Um, so, I want to make sure we have some time to, to hear from all of you. Uh, I do have more questions, but I'd love to turn it over to the audience now if you have questions. Um, if you would, just raise your hand. I'll, I'll direct to you and please say your name. Um, if you're a student, tell us what you're studying. Um, if you're a community member, tell us something interesting about you, who you work for, or um, why you're passionate or interested in, in cycling or citizen diplomacy. Please. Uh, hi, I'm Ruthann Garrell. I'm a senior studying biology here. And um, we've kind of talked about how we've seen bicycles transform in some other cultures. How do you see bicycles transform? How could you see how the bicycle transform in the United States? Do you see the place where that happened? I sure hope so. I, I do. I, I, I'm guessing Chris does. I think we all do. Um, but I think it's. Uh, I, I have. I have. I'm debating. I debate this a lot internally. I think there's some places in the United States are doing this a lot better than we are in Indianapolis. Um, and, uh, and and there may be different reasons for that. But uh, in terms of the bicycle being a a means of transportation for a lot more people in other other cities, uh, and infrastructure that's that's been built to, that's that's helping it. Those things are uh, are helping in cities that are getting high uh, high ratings on being a, a bicycle friendly city. And I think that's going to help us. I hope it's going to help us reduce our uh, the, the, the damage we're doing to the planet. But, it's slow rolling into the Midwest. I'm not, I'm not ashamed to say it. It's, it's difficult. A lot of the infrastructure is built up, and a lot of it's built around vehicles. So now it's how do you reverse a lot of that, and how do you, you restructure highways and roads so that they can be pedestrian and, and, and bicycle friendly? And you see some great examples of it. The, 
the uh, cultural trail, mm -hmm. you know, what, what's been done in the, with green lanes down in, in, in Fountain Square, some of the things that they're doing in Carmel with uh, using the planters very creatively to create some separated uh, bike lanes uh, from the vehicles. That Those are the types of things that, that we're really going to need to see with the distracted driving. There's so many distractions today in a vehicle, and that's that's a, it's got to be addressed. Well, and I lived in Washington, D.C. for about seven years, and uh, I sold my car when I moved there because I was going to be a grad student living on student loan, so I just knew I couldn't afford to park my car or keep my car, or keep my car full of gas. Uh, and it, within about six months, I realized it made a lot easier if I had a bicycle. Uh, and so I invested in my first one, and it changed so much for me. Uh, it was like being a kid again. And, uh, you know, riding through the city streets, a little dangerous. I didn't tell my parents about a lot of the, you know, riding down Connecticut Avenue and at however fast I would go downhill. And um, uh, just enjoyed seeing the city from a different viewpoint. Um, and while I came, you know, as a grad student in the, in the scheme of things, affluent, uh, privileged, and I could also see how useful and important and strategic bicycles could be for a lot of people in that community um, that you know, needed access to things that you know, the, the buses weren't necessarily convenient to every community in DC. Um, the metro did not go everywhere, um, it went to a lot of places. Um, and that's, that's just one big city. Uh, I think uh, bicycle and bicycle infrastructure can change not just access, uh, but also health. You know, I have never been happier or healthier when I've walked everywhere, I rode a bike everywhere. Um, it's not always an option. I'm from Dallas, you, you definitely don't want to walk or bike most places in that city. Uh, and even here, it, it just depends where in the, in the community that you need to go. Um, and how safe you feel on our roads, daytime, nighttime. Um, so I, I think there's a lot of progress that's been made. My first day in Indianapolis, I was uh, a, a guest in the mayor's office and the chief of staff pointed out all of the different uh, things that they had done over the previous years and what they were looking to do for Indy to increase walkability, uh, to increase bicycle infrastructure, and I was very impressed. Uh, but it, we definitely have some more work to do. Any other questions? Okay, well, to keep things interesting, I have an important question for both of our panelists. What's the most embarrassing thing that's happened to you on a bicycle? <laughs> <laughs> I know there's something. Well, uh, I have to go back quite a ways. I'll go back when I was a kid. I uh, always loved wrenching on things and thought I'd work on my bike. And, uh, you know, over the years, there's a lot of memories that have left. But this is one that is still very real in my mind. And, and uh, changing my front wheel, putting it back on, not tightening it up uh, appropriately. Um, I can still remember jumping a little berm and watching my front wheel just roll down. <laughs> and, you know, those probably couple seconds feel like the longest of your life when you know you're about to just have a terrible wreck. Luckily, I didn't break anything, but, uh, but that's one that, that I remember quite well. Yeah. Um, So, are you, are you looking at me because I need to I mean, I can go next okay. too. No, that's no, okay. I think I, ha I have, uh, I don't know, it's mine. Uh, mine would be way back in childhood, and it was on a green uh, five speed Schwinn Stingray with a banana seat. And, uh, you know, kind of the, and it had a, a gear shifter in the middle. So, you, you know, and it had these bars that came up like this, and you know, it was awesome. It's a great bike. Um, and uh, we were having a skidding contest, and I was, I thought of myself as the king of the skidders. 
Um, and I, uh, I, I got a lot of speed up and I hit the brakes and, you know, we were just seeing how far the skid mark from one place to another and measure it and we'd have this whole conversation about it. Well, I, I launched off the bike. I hit the brakes and it was <laughs> and uh, landed on my chin and, uh, and got lots of stitches and, yeah. I was fine. I was actually I was fine compared to other accidents I've had, but that was really embarrassing because I thought I, I, well, for me it was because I thought I was the guy. Mm -hmm. I didn't. It wasn't. It wasn't the case at all. I lost. Not that day. I didn't even. <laughs> I don't even think there was a mark on the pavement. So, um, but yeah, it was that was embarrassing, and uh, but we had a lot of fun in those bikes. Uh, mine is more recent. I'm. I'm I was an adult adopter of cycling. Uh, I had you know, ridden one as a child, but then I lived in Dallas, and then you get a car, and that's all everyone talks about. Uh, but in DC, I got, I got a bicycle, and maybe I would ride three to six miles uh, for commuting, and maybe on a long weekend ride, we might have done 15 or 20 miles. And for some reason, I was convinced by a colleague that I could definitely do a hundred mile ride. No! <laughs> she just was very convincing. And uh, my now husband and I both had uh, hybrid bikes, which means heavy, which means not built for speed. We didn't know that we needed some other kind of bicycle to do a hundred mile ride. They kept telling us it's one of the flattest uh, century rides you can do in the country, you'll be fine. Well, we discovered pretty quickly that we were working 10 times as hard as everyone else that was passing us at you know, 20 miles an hour. And we were like, what did we do? <laughs> uh, we did manage to finish. 11 hours later, no. oh. the after party was done. It was dark. The, there was still a, a loop recording. Congratulations, you've completed the Seagull Century ride. And I don't know how we made it across the finish line. But uh, being the geniuses that we are, you know, most people would have said that at the end of that, well, I'm never doing that again. They're like, we just make road bikes, and then this will be so much easier. Uh, it was about two hours easier the next time, but um, we survived it. Any audience questions for our esteemed panelists? It would have been three hours faster if you had seven years. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was still a grad student, so I didn't have fun of your zip wheels here. Hey, this is for uh, Chris. I'd like you to talk a little bit more about um, the uh, the refugee um, population that you that you use um, that you have as, as employees, um, even going back to the um, the picnic thing, what what eventually became necessary to get people from different cultures sort of together and talking, and, and if you can talk a little, a little bit more about that, and you know, we do have a, a Burmese refugee community here in, in town, and just the idea that they're being employed working uh, with, with uh, SRAM, I think is really interesting. I like to hear more about that. Yeah, so so fortunately, I ran into Martin. Study mission, and, and uh, we had a chance to chat. I didn't know that Indianapolis had a great resource like the International Center. So after we chatted a little bit, I said, "You know what? I, I think I think there's something here. I think uh, you might be able to help us with some of the challenges we're having." So we, we talked, and uh, we met, and we contracted with the International Center to come in and do a full assessment. So they come in, they they assign you a specialist. Um, they work with your teams. They do a lot of different interviews. Um, I don't know how many total hours, but it's got to be probably 80 total hours worth of interviews with different groups of people, uh, different populations, and then they tailor a program uh, basically to your to your culture, to your population, and then they come in and help you um, execute that that culture uh, and the training that goes along with it. So we've trained our supervisors. We've trained a lot of our native English speaking staff in the office, and we've done a lot of training with the uh, Burmese and, and Hispanic populations that, uh, that we have. And, and I think through that education, through that training, uh, and, 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 and understanding each other better has been a huge part of our progress. Hi, 
um, I'm Drew, I'm a freshman here. I'm a biology pre-veterinary major. And um, so I'll try to order this the best I can. Uh, how, in like places that you have been like, for experience or places in the world where like having bicycles is so important and just helpful for their daily lives, um, what would you like say is, I guess, better for daily life? Like, um, bicycles that are meant for more like speed, or bicycles that are meant like are heavier duty and like meant for like carrying things and like or going long distances. I don't know if I'm wording this right, but just or does it depend? Something. Sure. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, you want to take that one? I'll start. I uh, jump in. I, I, uh, there's a. I think it depends on what you're using it for. If it's transportation, but you, you see a lot of uh, bicycles now that uh, are being used for uh, uh, hot dog stands or food vendors or load carrying bicycles. Um, cargo bikes is a. It's a pretty big thing. There's there's stores in fact in. Portland, Oregon, Oregon, where they don't carry any regular speed bikes, they just carry cargo bikes and e-bikes, which is another thing going on, which is an electric bike. That's become a, a, a thing. Um, and Chris can comment on this too, but I, I do think that those, those kinds of bicycles are potentially what can really do a lot of good work for us to undo some of the things that maybe you know, that have been good to us, but we're realizing are, are damaging. Um, and that's, that, but that's going on in places around us, especially cargo bikes and bikes that are carrying people's stuff for work or whatever it may be. There's just all kinds of different models, but it, it is something that's being done in other places around the country and certainly in other places in the world. Mm -hmm. so, now quote FK from his uh, TEDx, he said it best when he said, you know, philanthropy really helps people who are stuck in poverty, but it won't get them out of poverty. <laughs> you really need that economic development piece of it to get people out of poverty. And that's where, uh, he said, the working 30 years in the bike industry uh, for making some of the fastest bikes, right? But his opinion is the most powerful bikes are the ones that are in the hand of that entrepreneur who's trying to you know, attack new markets and take their products further out um, with even you know, four times the travel distance with a bicycle and uh, you know, the, the power of having a bike in a, uh, a school schoolgirl's hands. You know, she's fighting for education. And that's that's really the, the power of the, the bike that, uh, that he sees. I would, I would echo have said um, that just from a brief times in developing countries, um, sometimes the simplest solution is the best. It's not always the complicated, high tech. Um, you know, the thing that works in Washington, D.C. or in Copenhagen, it may not be the same thing that works in Nairobi. Um, and it's really, you know, and you talked about this a little bit, it is getting to know the local population. What is the solution that both today and in the short term or long term is going to meet their need? You know, there is um, a debate about aid effectiveness from the U.S. and other Western countries, and, and there is a pitfall or a trap we can fall into of showing up with our solutions. Uh, that work somewhere we've seen and assume that it will always work in that same context and it doesn't always. Um, or sometimes, you know, it, as you alluded to, sometimes they can't then repair the great well that was built uh, with a lot of generosity, a lot of money, a lot of expertise brought to the table. It, if it breaks, you can't use it anymore. Um, if the bicycle breaks but you don't have the parts for it, so what? Um, but I would say that um, in my previous job, my role was to advocate for our funding for the State Department and USAID, all of our international development tools. And I will say that um, 
investing in those tools, investing in uh, the U.S. engagement with the world is crucial uh, because it's not so much the handout, it's that hand up. And maybe that bicycle is the thing that gets the entrepreneur's uh, amazing idea, innovation to his market. If that's the thing that gets him there or gets him to five different markets that he couldn't have gotten to on his feet, that is bringing a, a success story to, the, to his life um, and to that community. And it does have a long-term effect and has an impact in other ways that we can't expect or even measure. Um, so yeah, I think it just depends. In some cities, well, you know, I learned quickly I needed a faster bike. I needed a bike that could go uphill very fast in DC. Um, but there's a lot of places I would prefer that hybrid bike I started with. It would be a lot more, I could carry a lot more stuff. Uh, and then when we talk about cargo bikes in the US, how are they used most often to transport your children or your dog? I even saw a few cats on the trail in DC every now and then uh, in the little mesh uh, cargo. <laughs> yeah. But in other countries, it's transporting livelihood, it's transporting medicine, it's transporting food. Um, so that's okay. It's fun that we can, you know, cart our children or our animals around on the trail on a Saturday afternoon, but I'm so glad that that technology is being used in a different way in places that need it. like three small questions <laughs> so one do you give away the bikes to these people or do you sell it to them um, two do you meet any cultural resistance to receiving bikes and then three how do you help them repair it like whenever it's probably hard to get parts or the tools to repair their bikes all right so so the first one so I think when World Bicycle really started it was very much you know, we're going to provide these bikes to, uh, to students. And it was, I think, a, a earn a bike program where if they stayed in school for two years and uh, met some requirements, then they could actually get to keep the bike. Mm -hmm. right? and through that program, they saw, I think, a 25% improvement in attendance and a 55% improvement in student performance because you know, they didn't have to spend so much time walking to school mornings at night for whatever reasons, it performed so much higher because of that program. For the aid workers, those were provided through some of the partners with WBR, uh, but those were provided at no cost to those healthcare volunteers. And you know that's an interesting story where there was so much distance that those healthcare volunteers had to, to, to travel, and a lot of them you know did it on a volunteer basis. That the walking really was a deterrent, and a lot of them had started quitting after they were trained, and the bike really saved that program and made it one of the, 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 the leading programs for the prevention of AIDS and HIV in that region. So I think that's maybe the, the answer to the, the first part of your question. Uh, the second one? Cultural resistance. Oh, I'm sorry? Did you need cultural resistance to using bikes? Yeah, I, you know, I don't know if that's a great question. Um, did you see anything? Not a lot. I think there was uh, there were some gender issues. Um, honestly, they, the men thought they should have bikes, and there are challenges for sure. But there was it was within the culture, uh, and, and and that was something that had to be navigated with um, care. Yeah, that. I uh, think uh, maybe the answer is also kind of a third question when you sell the bikes. So, as people were receiving the bikes for free, students were or health care workers, uh, local business owners were like, hey, I could really use this bike because of the durability, because of how much weight it can carry, I can, I can expand my business and go to different markets. So, WBR, a nonprofit, actually has recently formed a for profit arm where uh, you can buy the bike, which is a relative bargain for the, the, the durability and the performance of the bike. They can buy the bike locally, and it's made and assembled locally, and then they can grow their business. So that's something that's it's a recent expansion for uh, the World Bicycle League. And it helps fund the nonprofit 
arm of uh, WBR. There is one question over here. Just focusing on the Indianapolis bicycle community, um, I did a grab project and we were looking at other cities and how much easier it is in other cities to figure out where you need to go by bike and how. And we have the lovely cultural trail and the, and the map and then there are some other resources, but we were looking at this and like, it, they don't mesh. If you want to go from point A to point B on your bike, how do you get there? And how do you get there safely? As well as, you know, I, I know they've, they've now added a lot of bicycle friendly stuff. Those little green left turn areas in downtown Indy scare me to death because the drivers do not know what they are. So maybe in 10 years, I will be willing to sit myself in the little green left turn area when the bicycle people have educated the car drivers. But there's a lot of, um, a lot of challenges. And I was wondering if you guys have any ideas about how we can, you know, help motorists accept those of us on our bikes traveling around and B, educate them a little bit about some of these lovely infrastructure changes and other ideas for how to make these changes a little more safe. <laughs> no, no, exactly. It seems like it's gonna be a cultural shift over time. I think when you talk to people in other cities who have been a part of this, at least from my experience, um, it's taken time, and I think it might take more time here because we are so heavily infrastructured on the car. So, um, there's been a lot of good work, it's, it's been mentioned already, in terms of bike lanes and pathways that are, that are created for bicycles. Um, but, you know, we, I was just working with my colleague Deb Lawrence recently, on, in a, and we were in a conversation about how to get people from freewheeling bikes, which is a great thing to know about. Freewheeling is uh, people that donate bikes from, the, from their garages or whatever they, let, they may have. They, they, they donate, it used to be Bicycle Action Project. They donate the bikes and then students uh, come in uh, after school and learn to work on the bikes and they earn a bike through that process mm -hmm. and then they have transportation. But where do they go? That was a question we were trying to, 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 to you know, figure out because there isn't a real safe pathway for them to roll out of the current location of freewheeling. Um, and, and, and we have sidewalks and that the sidewalks really aren't designed for the you know, pedestrian and bike and you know, the, the things that go on. And so you, you bring up a good question and I'm not really answering it much at all, other than I think that there is a, um, it's, gonna, it's gonna be a process and we gotta keep putting these questions and got to keep pushing on this kind of conversation regularly if we're going to get the change we need that will then make it easier for people to ride bikes and and, uh, and I think it'll help companies like SRAM and Shimano and all of these others that are actually doing things to, to you know, they'll see a shift potentially in what they do with, it, with maybe some of their, their what they're doing will be less performance based and more daily life based. And I think they'll be the ones that can do it. You know, so we're behind. I, and I, I wish I could I wish I could say, gosh, we're doing so well. But I and I think we've done good things, but we have a lot more to do. Well so. sometimes I think the loudest voices uh, that our elected officials here are gonna be the ones that are perfectly happy driving their car every day. Um, and, and there's just a smaller group of us that think that a bicycle um, is both fun and good transportation and good exercise and good for the environment. There's just not as many of us that talk about that or take the time to talk to our elected officials about it. Um, that's, I think, one way to slowly make a difference. But if they don't hear from us, then they just hear from those that prefer vehicles for transportation. Um, I know Pierre is about to close us out, but I do want to just quickly tie um, this really interesting conversation back up a little bit. Um, we, we started out talking about citizen diplomacy. Uh, there are so many ways uh, for students of international affairs and, and those in careers in international affairs uh, to engage with the world. 
to make a difference, to contribute uh, to places that need it. And even as a grad student in international affairs in our nation's capital with you know, every world country represented and embassies and, and diplomatic officials, um, I just assumed that the way I needed to contribute uh, with my degree was to go work for the State Department or to go work uh, for, the, for Peace Corps, for USAID. Uh, I did not realize that there were a lot of other ways that I could bring that knowledge and perspective to a career that I would still find satisfying and engaging and, and um, can, that I could contribute. And some of those ways are working for a business that has a diverse workforce and bringing that cultural knowledge and expertise to the table and ensuring uh, that your immigrant workforce is taken care of and that their perspective is considered and that you train your employees from all cultures to better understand and have sensitivity towards each other. Um, it can happen in academia where you continue to teach the next generation about opportunities to engage with the world. Uh, it can happen in sports. I am no athlete, uh, clearly, if it took me 11 hours to do a century ride, <laughs> barely making it across the finish line. Um, but that is one way that is it's actually so natural. The, you know, the concept of sports diplomacy, you know, everyone might play with the same rules when you talk about soccer, football. Mm -hmm. um, with cycling, too, you know, we can all cheer on the Tour de France uh, cyclists from all over the world. And uh, it's a way, there are, there are inexpensive ways to build relationships when you don't speak the same language, you're not from the same culture, but suddenly you can play on the same team. You know, in a dirt field with a simple uh, soccer ball. And you can work uh, for the federal government and you can learn about a specific country and you can bring that knowledge to the table in a key strategic negotiation. Um, but what's so interesting is that all of these things come together, all of them are connected. Uh, the way we engage with the world from here in Indianapolis, it's happening every day. It's happening with SRAMs and wheels. It's happening with their refugee workforce who now have a different ex or different experience with their Hoosier bosses and that feel welcome and feel encouraged. And it's happening with international students on the cycling team in an unexpected place that has a world-class cycling team. Uh, and that they're learning both uh, to be better cyclists but also better citizens of the whole world, not just of Indiana. Um, and it's happening in our, our community and our, our elected officials trying to make this a better infrastructure. And um, I just want to encourage you, especially our students here in the room, uh, don't limit yourself. When you're thinking about your career, it will be easy to do that, especially when you start applying for jobs and you're not getting any answers. Um, don't just assume that you have this one specific path, this one specific career. You'd be surprised what you'll learn in different things what you'll learn in the Peace Corps, uh, what you'll learn in an MBA program, that suddenly, you know, you're running a huge company here and working with an immigrant workforce, that, uh, skills you may not have realized you need to prepare for. Um, so just absolutely encourage you to consider maybe that path that you think, that's definitely not for me. It might be. And you might be able to take the expertise from your international affairs studies right to that table and it will be even more valuable there uh, because it's not already at that conference table. Well, let's give a good hand to you. touched on things that we address, um, but in, in ways that we don't look at, so it's just been terrific. Uh, there is a reception outside if you want to talk to the speakers, have some uh, fresh fruit and Aramark cookies or whatever we have out there, um, and, 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 and hang back a little bit. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll go out there to carry on the conversation a little bit, right? Pierre, yes. and one last thing, yes. I will be in trouble if I don't say this. The International Center 
as internships. Mm. Every semester and summer, uh, we would love to have you. Uh, it is a way to get international experience from right here in Indianapolis. Uh, we host five to seven students each uh, season and you can work about 20 hours a week you can get hands-on experience with the world it could be walking around with one of our international visitor delegations from who knows where it could be uh, accompanying us as we set up flags at the governor's office for him to welcome a delegation from abroad uh, it could be uh, meeting the international employees coming to work here for Lilly and Dow and, and other companies uh, and it's not often you can do that here in Indy, and so we would love to have you if you're interested. Uh, there is a, a little flyer out uh, at the registration table, um, but please come talk to me or Martin uh, about that, and we'd love to get you connected to our internship coordinator. And I will add to that that we've had several um, over the years global studies students do internships at the International <laughs> Center and get global studies internship credit for GLS 360. Mm -hmm. Um, so if you're in the Global Studies program, it's a globally focused internship with that students. And in fact, one student who's studying abroad this semester in Spain is actually going to be arranging a Skype interview um, for a, a, an internship with you guys. So um, it's a great opportunity um, and uh, absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, we'll, we'll have